So good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the slight delay. We're only just getting used to having guests back in Roosevelt House, and we expect um, quite a few friends to be coming in and out during this this spectacular sounding conference. And um, I'm, I'm Harold Holzer. I have the honor of serving as director of Roosevelt House. And on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, I want to welcome you um, to the most uh, timely event we've ever scheduled in the history of Roosevelt House. <laughs> what better moment to discuss the New Deal and the new New Deal than on the day that the president of the United States is directing the New New Deal from the Vatican. I think that's a pretty interesting, <laughs> pretty interesting moment. Um, and we're, of course, we're also the perfect place to have these discussions. Um, as I told our, our, our honored group, who, who we've come to call the descendants, which sounds glib, but I, it, it, it's meaningful because it's the descendants of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, whose home this was and of the Brain Trust and the cabinet members um, who are gathered with us tonight, uh, today, and this afternoon. This was, of course, the home that uh, Sarah Delano Roosevelt gave to FDR and Eleanor, at least half of it, um, as a combination wedding and Christmas present in 1905. Um, it came with the caveat that uh, Sarah was going to live on the uh, west side of the house, and the east side was reserved for Franklin and Eleanor. And then um, she famously moved the walls back in the dining room and opened the house. And as Eleanor unforgettably said, um, my mother-in-law was on my side of the house for the next 25 years, sometimes at the, at the most unexpected moments, <laughs> which we leave to our collective imagination. It's also the home where Franklin Roosevelt um, recovered from his bout with polio. It's the place where he uh, managed his gubernatorial campaigns and his first campaign for the presidency. And in the second floor library upstairs, it is the place where um, the ancestors of our special guests gathered with FDR almost on a daily basis between Election Day 1932 and the date of the Roosevelt's departure for Washington around March 1st, 1933, to build the foundational blocks of the New Deal. So we're so honored to use Roosevelt House as a teaching institution for new generations of students, uh, and so honored to have all of you here to discuss the New Deal and what it, what it means in terms of history and how it might inspire and inspirit the future. Um, when Tomlinson is here, I always say that his grandmother, Frances Perkins, um, um, entered this house with a set of demands in order to be um, to be considered for Secretary of Labor. It was nothing less than um, minimum wage, maximum hours, uh, child labor laws, disability insurance, um, the, the forerunner of Medicare, and of course, old age pensions. Uh, all of that in one demand letter for a job interview, which I think is pretty extraordinary. <laughs> and that happened upstairs on the second floor as well. So as I mentioned, we are honored today to welcome a distinguished group of descendants of Franklin Roosevelt and his cabinet members. They will get fuller introductions during the course of the day as they participate in panels. But just to mention them, uh, Tomlin Perkins Cogglesall, who I mentioned a moment ago, uh, David Hopkins Giffen, who was the great grandson of Harry Hopkins, June Hopkins, the granddaughter and biographer of Harry Hopkins, uh, James Roosevelt Jr., the grandson of Franklin and Eleanor, Phoebe Roosevelt, the great-granddaughter of FDR and ER, and um, the brain trust behind the, this gathering, Henry Scott Wallace, who was the grandson of Franklin Roosevelt, Secretary of Agriculture and Commerce, um, and of course, uh, his vice president, Henry A. Wallace. Welcome to, to all of you. Um, I, I can't let this moment go by where we're just going to be ex totally celebratory um, without acknowledging the fact that there is uh, someone in the room whose grandfather was, shall we say, not a great supporter of the New Deal. So he's going to lead the loyal opposition, but I think he's sort of reformed. And that's Hamilton Fish, who is in the back. Um, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Ham Actually, I always tell him I met his grandfather in 1986 
when, and this is the Roosevelt contemporary, the Martin, Barton, and Fish, Hamilton Fish, who for some reason, but it was great, decided to endorse Bella Abzug when she ran for Congress in Westchester in a failed comeback bid in 1986. That was one of the best press conferences I've ever seen. I think he was, he, I know he was in his 90s at the time, and he spoke for about 30 minutes um, in this endorsement. It was quite, quite a show. Um, so um, thank you all for your vision and dedication. Special welcome to my friend Jonathan Alter, who is the chronicler of several presidencies, um, not just the ones he covered as a journalist, but of course his, um, his writings on Franklin Roosevelt uh, and his magisterial biography most recently of Jimmy Carter. It's great to have John in the house. John actually was in the house when it was locked down. He somehow managed to get in and film a television segment um, for which he assumed full uh, medical liability. So we let him do it and it seems to have worked. So this was a year of planning to get to this point. Um, um, in the long campaign to bring attention not only to the New Deal but to how it should inspirit our current deliberations about the social safety net and the social contract. So we could not be more pleased and proud that all of your work led you here to Roosevelt House and we look uh, forward to a great conference. So just a note, I'm going to do the housekeeping thing and then just get off. Um, I see you're all, um, you all understand that we need to be masked inside the building, even though you've all gone through the CUNY vaccine check, for which thanks. Our speakers, uh, like our professors in the classes upstairs, do not have to be masked. They will be unmasked so you can see and hear them better. They've also been vetted for vaccination, I promise. Um, those of you who will join us virtually will note that we will take only five minute breaks between the sessions so we can pack all of our information and our, and our comments in to our three hours. And there will be an opportunity at the end of each session for audience questions. Uh, we will have a microphone, hand microphone brought around. You don't need to grab it, it will be held for you. That's another new COVID protocol. Um, but other than that, you look prepared. Um, I would like to hand it off now uh, to man again who is really shepherded us to this point and is moderating the first panel with, with John Alter and Nancy McLean. Please welcome Henry Scott Wallace. Thank you, Harold, and thank you to Jennifer Rabb and to the Roosevelt House for your hospitality. Uh, it's a fantastic partnership. Thank you for inviting us and, and making us feel so welcome. Um, I want to ask uh, Nancy and Jonathan to come on up and cue a very brief introductory video. So Doris, what changed for Joe Biden once he won, once he got in office? I think what changed for him is the pandemic and the economic fallout and the fact that he was facing a crisis. It changed the country. It changed our view of leadership and it changed Biden himself. You know, I think the reason why FDR gets talked about a lot is it's really the last time that the country felt this enormous fear and anxiety that we've lived with for the last year and hungered for leadership. And when he provided that leadership, he said, the government headlines said, the government still lives. You know, we have a leader. And it was a sense of responsibility on the government's part to the people that lasted until another transformational leader came along, Ronald Reagan in 1981, another joint session of Congress, his first speech. And he said, government is the problem, not the solution. And a generation of conservatives followed massive tax cuts, reduced federal spending. Now Biden's coming back. It's the kaleidoscope turns again right. to say it's time for government to not have the trickle down theory, but instead to be responsible for the social being of the country. But in many ways, the right wing in the country is still living in reaction to this redefinition of the relationship between the state and the individual that unfolded amid the crisis of the 1930s. So we are now going to have a little discussion about that arc of history that was just very briefly described. Uh, Jonathan has been introduced uh, in his brilliant book about the first hundred days of the Roosevelt administration, The Defining Moment, a brilliant book, I recommend it highly, and Nancy is the author of a, a brilliant book about the pushback against that uh, starting in the 50s uh, and this, the right wing dismantling of what 
or the hoped for dismantling. We'll see what happens in the next week or two. Uh, and uh, it's called Democracy in Chains and a fantastic read as well. So we're gonna start with Jonathan to talk about the New Deal and then Nancy to follow. And then we'll have a little discussion about where that leaves us now. So Jonathan, take it away. So I wanted to just quickly, thank you, Scott. And and thank you, Harold. Um, I, I wanted to just quickly kind of set the scene for what life in the United States was like uh, on the eve of FDR taking office in 1933. Um, in those days, the inauguration was in March. Um, so the, um, the economy in the last quarter of uh, 1932 dropped so precipitously that it set off a banking crisis um, and banks started to close in Michigan and other parts of the country and um, many were already closed when um, when Roosevelt took office uh, the uh, governor of New York closed the banks here on the night before the inauguration so uh, we were on a you know barter economy in a lot of places um, and uh, John Maynard Keynes in Great Britain was asked, have we ever seen anything like this before in human history? And he said, yes, it was called the Dark Ages and it lasted for 400 years. Uh, and um, people were um, depressed, not just economically, but uh, emotionally and mentally. And there was a kind of a, uh, you know, there was not you know, trouble in the streets, although there were uh, an awful lot of military who were put in place for the inauguration more than at any time until this year uh, uh, for the inauguration. Um, but um, people truly didn't know what was going to happen. And um, starting with his famous uh, inaugural address, which was important not just for the great line about the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, uh, but for other things he said. When you think about that line, if you're worried about putting food on the table or a roof over your head, that's not just fear itself. So that wasn't the, fear wasn't the only thing to, to fear. Um, there were real things to fear for millions of Americans, but it was a kind of a suspension of disbelief, a conjuring act on Roosevelt's part, and actually the most important parts of the speech were when he said, we need action and action now. And that set, and he used that word action five times in the speech. Uh, and so it was clear that he was going to start moving immediately. Um, and and uh, he was asked, uh, the stakes were so high that uh, he was asked, um, uh, are told by a, a visitor. Uh, the identity of this person has never actually surfaced, so it could be an apocryphal story. Uh, historians are a little suspicious when there's not a name attached, but a visitor said, uh, Mr. President, if you succeed, you'll be our greatest president, and if you fail, you'll be our worst president. And Roosevelt said, no, if I fail, I'll be our last president. And uh, the New York Daily News had a headline on an editorial, Wanted a Dictator. Um, the uh, Studebaker company made a car called the Dictator that was quite popular among people who still had any money in the early 30s. Um, Mussolini was very popular, in, not just in Italy, but in the United States at that time. Hitler was just coming in in the same month, so nobody knew much about him yet. Um, so people wanted strong leadership, and uh, when Joe Biden was asked about, uh, you know, what struck him most in reading uh, about uh, the early Roosevelt presidency, his answer was the fragility of democracy. Um, that was his takeaway from my book and others. Um, and so he senses that not only, this isn't just about new programs that they're talking about this week that uh, are an extension of the New Deal, but uh, an ability to um, re-energize 
and even save democracy by showing that government can deliver for the people. Um, so what was the New Deal? Um, it actually, it, it was quite literally what it said. It was a new contract, a deal, with the American people over what we owed each other. And all of the programs, all of the structural ideas on uh, regulation um, and the uh, jobs programs, they all came from a new conception of what we owed each other. Coming out of the laissez-faire 1920s, as it was called, when uh, it was every man for himself, and Roosevelt said, no, this idea of just sort of voluntary efforts, not enough. We need the government changing certain laws so that we can begin to connect with each other and lift each other up. And that's what happened. Now, to give you some hope, uh, what Joe Biden is about to get through, and I'm, failure is not an option, so they will, this will get done. Uh, it will add up to um, close to $5 trillion in public investment, which dwarfs anything that was done in the early New Deal. Now, it's a bigger country, but we are still on that same path. For those who are disappointed that certain things aren't in there, um, I would just uh, urge you to read up on um, where Roosevelt felt short. He had huge Democratic majorities, but he didn't have Southern Democrats on a lot of things. Uh, they were racist Southern Democrats, so he had to um, compromise. So the Social Security Act of 1935 uh, was uh, actually not a very good piece of legislation. Um, it, it excluded uh, jobs that African Americans held because that was the only way that um, Roosevelt could get it through Congress where many of the committees were chaired by Southern segregationists, but he knew that they could build on it in the years after that, um, and, and that he could come back to Congress for more, and that once there was kind of proof of principle established, and you were, you were filling out that new social contract, you could add new clauses. So I just mentioned that for people to take heart. So okay, there's not a clean electricity plan, which was a very important part of uh, Biden's program, but there are a lot of other, there's more than $500 billion in, uh, in investments in clean energy. And uh, there's a climate uh, core that's modeled on the Civilian Conservation Corps. It was one of the most important part of Roosevelt's first 100 days. And a series of other things that can be built on. Same is true the social welfare part of his of uh, Biden's program. Once you get, you know, your foot in the door with major legislation, which is what's um, happening right now, you can build on it. And it's very important for those who believe in these ideas to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and take yes for an answer and come back and fight another day. I'll just uh, close by. Um, uh, telling a story that many of you have probably heard about um, what happened shortly after Roosevelt's death in 1945. Um, um, his, uh, uh, m the motorcade with the flag draped coffin was moving through Washington and uh, a man broke down in tears the side of the road and a reporter said, did you know the president? And the man said, no but he knew me. And, and that sense of being able to walk in the shoes of the American people uh, and connect to them, even though he came from a very different background than most people, uh, was part of the Roosevelt magic. Um, when he'd give a fireside chat, he would imagine a man painting a ceiling, and another person at the cash register, and uh, ordinary people listening at the other end to the fireside chats. And uh, so part of effective leadership is making people believe that they have been seen and heard. And we will, um, we will see as time goes on 
uh, whether Joe Biden is capable of doing that. Um, I believe that despite these temporary uh, problems he ha he's having in the polls, he's off to an historic start. I have the counterpoint <laughs> role here. Um, start with a quote. They should have been shot. That is what Charles Stuart Mott, a leader of the General Motors uh, board and a philanthropist, told Studs Terkel when asked about the famed 1937 strikers, sit down strikers who built the UAW. They had no right to sit down there, he s explained to Terkel in 1970. The governor should have told them to move on or we'll shoot and done it. Sure, he allowed, there would have been a certain number of people killed, but the lesson would have taken and stopped Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whom Mott called the Great Destroyer. All those years later, Mott still held to the property supremacist beliefs of the American Liberty League that the chairman of General Motors, Albert Sloan, had joined with the three DuPont brothers uh, and leading bankers to launch in 1934. Why? Irene DuPont minced no words. He said, the so-called New Deal is nothing more or less than the socialist doctrine called by another name. The Socialist Party leader, Norman Thomas, objected that it was not, but to no avail. DuPont envisioned the group as a property owners association to preserve economic liberty with the America since the late 19th century Gilded Age as a model. League members held to the now embattled elite creed. Inviolable property rights were the basis of liberty. Government had no right to interfere with business, let alone enable workers to organize. After all, poverty was inevitable, caused by laziness or immorality. Voluntary private charity for the deserving poor was the only proper help. As for those like the Flint sit-down strikers, they deserved what they what they would get. Sorry, I thought I was gonna be at a podium and this was gonna be a little more <laughs> subtle. <laughs> no, it's cool, as long as you bear with me. Uh, so League members viewed Roosevelt's policies as violations of their rights and infringements on their liberty, rights and liberty that, liberties that they believed were enshrined in the US Constitution as originally written. Stunned at losing unilateral control of their enterprises, they set out to win it back. They worked mainly with Republicans at first and after 1937 with conservative Southern Democrats. The League drew some of the wealthiest and most powerful men in America. It had the editorial backing of much of the press and the radio. It had more funding than a political party, all of which made it the leading opposition to Roosevelt. Yet ultimately, it failed and miserably by 1936 for reasons that have a lot to tell us about what we face today. Because today, we face a radical right that has studied and learned from past failures to achieve a power that no one outside its own ranks would have predicted in 2008. I could not agree more wholeheartedly with Jonathan Alter's vision of the New Deal's achievements and with that of the conference organizers about what America needs in our pivotal moment for the economy, for the well-being of the people, life on our planet, and to save democracy from the forces now menacing it. But to achieve that vision in the face of existential threats, I believe it is absolutely vital to take full measure of the opposition. And here is a troubling truth. Progressive Americans have never come to terms fully with the relentless determination of the capitalist radical right. Not all capitalists, I want to make very clear, but the most arch and ideo ideological, those like Charles Stuart Mott, Albert Sloan, and the DuPonts in FDR's day, and like Charles Koch and the network of don like-minded donors he has built up in our own time. They, these men, feel a deep sense of legitimacy in their quest to overpower robust multiracial democracy. As a historian of the American right, I can tell you that li this lineage goes back, goes way back. In fact, goes all the way back to the most unyielding figures at the first Constitutional Convention in 1787, the slaveholding delegates from South Carolina and Georgia. 
Among the richest men of their time, they insisted on putting the most property encasing anti-democratic articles into the Constitution as the price of their staying to sign on to it. That lineage then moves on through the leaders of the militant South who seceded from the Union. It reemerged with the destruction of Reconstruction when the reunion of northern and southern elites created the free-range capitalism that the American Liberty League and the Charles Koch Network look back to as a model. After the League closed its doors in 1940, the tradition went dormant, but only for a short time, reemerging in the post-war Red Scare, the John Birch Society, the radicalization of the Republican Party by the 1964 Barry Goldwater campaign, the 1971 Powell Memorandum calling for a corporate mobilization to restore the power and authority of what he called free enterprise, then the victory of Ronald Reagan and the Gingrich Republicans. In our time, we see this tradition at work in the pincers operation created by the Koch donor network and a GOP voter base radicalized by Fox News and Donald Trump. What united this tradition over time was an ideology that I have come to think about as property supremacy. Its callousness toward the people, I think, is well captured in that quote I began with from Charles Stuart Mott. While it is hard for most of us to imagine some of the richest men seeing themselves as victims exploited by their fe uh, fellow citizens in order to grasp why they are trying to permanently rig the rules of our society today, we must. So let me turn then, uh, as I start wrapping up, to the fate of the uh, American Liberty League. Again, remember, this league included some of the wealthiest, most powerful men of the age. How did it lose, in a word? Politics, politics in a particular context. FDR was a master player at turning the tables on these men, and they were clueless, absolutely clueless, about how to win over voters. One Texas businessman quipped about the Liberty League's disastrous opposition to Roosevelt in 1936, and I quote, the capitalist system can be destroyed more effectively by having men of means defend it than by importing a million reds from Moscow to attack it. But now, fast forward. Like the Obama administration before it, the Biden administration came into office with a tremendously popular agenda and more voters behind it than ever before. Yet, both ran into unyielding opposition that almost immediately trimmed their sails. Why the difference in efficacy with FDR? Many reasons we can discuss this afternoon, but the crucial one I want to uh, point to is the difference between the American Liberty League and the Koch Network. Although they share that same ideology of extreme economic liberty at odds with most of what most of the people want uh, and with the well-being of the people and the planet, in our case, today's arch capitalist right has learned from past failures. And that's really what I want to, uh, to end with here. Um, after having studied and learned from the uh, previous losses, the Coat Network has built a determined, unbelievably well-funded powerhouse to defeat the Biden agenda and the popular hopes it represents. The Koch folk, though, are far more strategic than their forebears. Instead of putting rich men on the front lines, the ultra-wealthy fund literally hundreds of organizations that can appear independent of them. They fend scholars and PR firms and pollsters and think tanks to gussy up Liberty League tenants and make them sound forward-looking. And unlike the League, they have built alliances with popular forces. They have uh, uh, reached out and, and aligned with uh, groups that have large numbers of motivated voters, above all the religious right and gun owners. And sadly, this donor-built right is employing a more cohesive, integrated and message discipline strategy than Democrats have in play, and one with a clear end game. That end game is radical rules change uh, to enable a tiny ideological minority to dominate a vast majority that is yearning to meet the challenges of the 21st century, but is stymied by all of what I have just described. And we can go into the details of that rule rigging, but I think you can pretty quickly conjure them up. Um, so before, though, I leave you all terrified and discouraged after <laughs> Jonathan's wonderful presentation, let me add something else as a historian and a historian who has studied uh, and teaches about social movements. That is, never before in our history, through all the times that the property supremacists almost prevailed, 
Never before in our history has the progressive side had greater and more wide-ranging resources. Certainly, the progressive side did not have those resources or anything like them in the 1860s or in the 1930s or in the 1960s. Our potential today could be truly unbeatable if, if we were aligned and determined as the other side is. But, and this is a very big but, if we fail to recognize that those blocking progress believe deeply that they are in a war for their country, and if we fail to uh, see that they are much more strategically marshalling their resources to win that, f that war, then, then we could lose everything. We still have time, but not much. Thank you. That's great, Nancy. Thank you. That illuminates a lot. And you touched on um, the differences between where FDR found himself and, and where Biden finds himself. Um, you, I'm sure you know uh, the Rauchway book now, Why the New Deal Matters. There was a professor, Jeffrey Isaac, who explained in a review of that three reasons, uh, huge reasons, that today is harder for Biden than, uh, than it was for FDR. One is that labor is weaker now than it was then. They were a huge ally of FDR. One is the racialization of our politics, the, the George Floyd murder and this uh, critical race theory stuff that is being exploited by the right and promoting division. And the other is uh, the, the sort of civil war among the Republican Party with the conspiracy theorists uh, promoting division and discord and toxicity in our politics. And then you, of course, have talked about in your book uh, how the, the right has learned that they can't win a, a majority vote through regular voting. They have to rig the, the vote. They have to get fewer of them, uh, of us to vote and more of them. Uh, so you got to rig the game. You got to change the rules. So would you each talk about whether fundamentally you think Biden, you, you've given some cause for optimism that Biden can be uh, FDR if the progressive uh, movement can organize. And uh, we do have a great deal of resources. But if you would both comment on, uh, on whether this can be a New Deal moment despite these headwinds and Fox News and everything else. He's not gonna be an FDR, uh, you know, um, because FDR, first of all, he's in office for 12 years and um, he had overwhelming Democratic majorities. And it's quite possible that the Democrats will lose the House next year. Um, so it may be that this moment that we're in right now is what a lot of what we're gonna get. Now, there's been some, I think, misunderstanding of uh, what early next year could bring. Um, so, um, the rules have just been clarified by the parliamentarian that you can go and use reconciliation, the budget reconciliation process, more than once a fiscal year now. So at the beginning of next year, uh, the Democrats can come at some of these things that they fell short on, but they have to com convince Manchin and Cinema. So, you know, um, the, uh, just to give you an example, in the 1932 election, the Democrats won 97 seats, new seats. They had huge, and this is something that Rauschway didn't, to me, that the most important difference are the margins. And so, and they won uh, 12 seats in the Senate that year. So, um, yes, Roosevelt had a divided Democratic Party between Northern uh, liberals and southern racist conservatives, and he had to do a lot of tap dancing to keep his party united, and and maybe didn't do as well on civil rights as Eleanor and clearly us would have wanted him to in a perfect world. Um, but he was able to get a huge amount of his program through. Uh, not everything. In 1937, he, he tried to expand the Supreme Court, which people are suggesting that including me, that Biden should, should do, and it didn't work. Um, so even Roosevelt 
you know, could not get everything he wanted. But I, I, I just, I, I think the, you know, whatever one thinks of Joe Manchin, uh, he had a good line when uh, he was asked, uh, you know, why should he have the uh, power to take out these progressive things that he's deleting? The billionaire's tax is the one that is ticking me off the most today. But, um, and he said, well, elect more Democrats. You know, it's not that complicated. Like, people have to stop wringing their hands and start ringing doorbells. And then Sorry. maybe something can change. That, that's a great line I'm going to have to plagiarize it, <laughs> um, and we're all going to have to use. Uh, so I would just add a few more structural things to that because I think some accounts now of what the difference is do go astray. Um, and it just you know, speaking as a historian, I mean, one thing I'd say is that the parties used to be crazy quilts. It's hard for me to tell students this, but there used to be liberal Republicans, right, <laughs> in places like New York. And there were totally reactionary Democrats, but it was in that crazy quilt system, Roosevelt was able to, prepare, um, to prevail. Now, it's one of those be careful what you wish for things, as people were talking about in the 1940s and 50s on the progressive side, wanting to have an ideological sorting of the parties. It came too late after labor was weakened and many other things had happened, but now we have a Republican Party, which, and it, there's p political scientists who talk about this as, you know, um, I don't know, they have some clunky term, but basically it's the Republicans who have polarized, right? I mean, they're off the charts in aggression and discipline, in, you know, norm breaking, uh, and in the agenda that they're carrying. So that makes for a very different lineup, particularly yeah. if you have the kind of small margins that Scott is talking about. But the other thing I think is, uh, another thing that's really an important piece of that, in the 1930s, the South was, as Roosevelt said, the nation's number one economic problem, right? These Southern reactionary, senators and, and House members, at least in the early New Deal, um, before labor became stronger, thought, we need this thing. <laughs> you know, our region has been sick for a decade now. All our industries are sick, agriculture, coal, you know, uh, et cetera, tobacco. So they wanted that federal action. They wanted that intervention uh, in the South. Now the South is pretty wealthy and it's all Republican. So it's a very, very different kind of national map. I think there's other things too, that the international situation. Roosevelt was you know, imminently con uh, conscious, as were many in Congress, that they had fascism on the right and communism on the left and that they were trying to show to the people that liberal democracy could deliver, right? That it could really work for the people did that magnificently, but we don't have that situation either now. And the last thing I'll say, when Roosevelt um, was, was putting through the New Deal, we talked about Francis Perkins um, earlier today, who was a person of deep faith, there was a almost a religious phalanx defending the New Deal, right? Catholics, Jews, mainline Protestants who still had huge congregations, we're in a different world now with the faith map in this country. Um, so that, that's another feature, I think, of the difference. So I think there have been deep economic, political, uh, structural, and cultural changes that we need to be mindful of, but then I think it goes to being politically savvy and strategic enough to be able to navigate that new world. Jonathan, let me just interject yeah. briefly. Uh, uh, there will be a time for Q&A, so uh, we're taking questions over Zoom and in the room, so think about that as Jonathan responds. I was just going to say very responds. briefly, I, I completely agree with you that there's a kind of a toughness gap here between the parties, and, and Roosevelt you know, was arguably much tougher mm -hmm. as a politician, and that Democrats nowadays need to grow a pair, I think, if they're going to compete in this environment that you described. Um, and there's a certain... Um, uh, kind of almost uh, unilateral disarmament. That's not to say that they should engage in the lies and politics of personal destruction that the Republicans use, but they need to get tougher. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, uh, and especially in, in mobilizing resentment. So it looks like uh, Terry McAuliffe will probably lose in, uh, in Virginia. Uh, the latest polls are not good. I mean, he could prove me wrong, but, um, you know, uh, they somehow, when they get in the scrum, and that's a democratic state now, they're, they're missing something about how to connect with voters and where they really live. 
Just to second that yeah. point, one of the um, wonderful people that I've gotten to know since Democracy in Chains came out is um, retired Army Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, um, who was Colin Powell's um, uh, um, assistant aide, um, and he, uh, when when Colin Powell was Secretary of State, and um, I asked Larry why, because now he's quite a critic of U.S. foreign policy and uh, much much of what's going on in the country. And what turned him was Colin Powell being forced to lie by the Bush administration about the weapons of mass destruction and then the torture. But anyway, he's an, an extraordinary voice now for. Uh, defending democracy, and he was part of two of the national uh, coalitions, the Task Force on National Election Integrity and the Protect Democracy Group. Anyway, one of those uh, in the run-up to the 2020 election had wargaming exercises, and as a military person, you know, mm -hmm. he could participate in this, and I'm not saying anything out of school. They actually told the press this, but when the Democrats showed up for these wargaming exercises, they were so complacent and blasé that the other people had to say, hey, if you're not gonna get serious and understand that the other side is thinking of this as a war and they wanna take you out, there's no point in us doing this exercise. So just to underscore your point that I think there's, you know, very strategic calculation going on on one side that is playing quite advanced chess while we're treating everything as kind of a normal election um, when we're not in normal times anymore and we're not facing uh, a normal opposition. Well, I hope uh, January 6th demonstrated the, the reality of the war clearly to everybody. Uh, any questions in the room? Uh, a, a microphone? Um, uh, a front row here. Thanks. Uh, I, I wonder if you could uh, each say a little bit about the role of the media uh, in the New Deal versus the role of the media today. Yes. Uh, frankly, I only know a little bit of, I know there was sensationalist media, I know there was mainstream media uh, then and so on, uh, but there, you know, there obviously was not cable TV and, and so on. Today, uh, we have the fragmentation of media, the constant presence of media, but even the mainstream media we have that likes to characterize, for example, what's been going on in Congress uh, over the last two months as infighting, yeah. not co not compromise and negotiation, but make it sound like uh, make it sound like trivial politics. Uh, uh, can you talk about how the media has influenced where we were then versus where we are now? I'm so glad that you raised that point. This is uh, Jim Roosevelt, uh, and I'm so honored to be in the presence of so many uh, descendants of the Roosevelts and the uh, Roosevelt uh, Brain Trust and high, high Command. So, yeah, I got really, I uh, like threw down my New York Times when I saw they had a lead uh, few weeks ago about Democrats feuding. The Democrats aren't feuding, they're legislating. <laughs> like, they're so out of the habit of covering real legislation because we've had so little of it mm -hmm. in the last few years. Uh, you know, Trump just had like two or three major pieces of legislation total uh, that they, they don't get that this process that we're seeing up close right now is actually pretty normal. And, and But in answer to your basic question, in uh, the 1930s, um, the reporters were pro-New Deal and the owners were anti-New Deal. So the editorials would be against Roosevelt, but the news coverage would be, you know, sometimes slanted in his favor and certainly buying into uh, his agenda. So just to give you one, uh, I think, relevant example, uh, from the time at the 1932 convention when he coined the phrase the New Deal, we need a New Deal for America, the press immediately picked up on it and his entire program was in that frame. Compare that to Build Back Better, which Biden introduced last year. Now you could argue, well, Biden's not as good a communicator as Roosevelt. I'll stipulate that. But also, the press like won't call it his Build Back Better better program, because I don't know if they think that's like carrying water for him to call his program what he calls it. Um, and we saw that some under uh, Obama as well. Um, so this fragmentation that you're talking about has led to the introduction of flat out lies into our political discourse. So we have, you know, a third of the country that believes that Biden is a isn't a legitimate president, which is a terrible 
terrible thing for us. And I would argue that actually our democracy is under more threat today than it was uh, in, in the early 1930s. Uh, I, I didn't really think we were ripe for revolution in that period, and we weren't gonna have fascism either. Um, and now I think we're more in danger, as Scott said, elections rigged and the Republicans are in a position where they're basically saying uh, heads we win, tails you lose, we'll litigate every election that we, we lose. And I think they will probably for many, many years to come. And the reason they can get away with this is because they have a, uh, a, uh, a network that has now really shaded over into promoting lies. They're about to say that January 6th was a false flag and you know, just try to or, turn it into an Orwellian moment where they just completely deny what everybody saw with their own eyes. So I'm seriously alarmed about where we are right now, and I think it's really for the reasons that you put your finger on. And I would just add to that, and, and I'll be brief, because I know questions are starting to come up from the audience, but uh, the kind of folks that I was talking about were crucial in ending the fairness doctrine in media, right, in broadcasting. And so that opened the, the airwaves to the Rush Limbaugh's, the Mark Levins, you know, all of these people, and to Fox News. Um, and so, uh, so I think that's part of the mix. And also the falling out of the financial bottom of so much journalism, investigative journalism, particularly at the state level. So we don't have people really reporting on the, what's going on in states, like my North Carolina. There, there aren't people on that b state house beat in the way that they used to be. And of course, there's Fox News, the elephant in the room, which media scholars have shown us doesn't actually provide news and adequate information. It's a 24-7 identity cultivating and agitating mechanism to produce in its viewers this sense of this embattled white, particularly evangelical identity. And when people are in that stress state of thinking everyone is attacking them, they're not especially rational. So they're very vulnerable to these kinds of challenges. But there are, there are some really great, uh, if anybody's interested in talking more about this, um, uh, there's a great book called The Disinformation Age that a number of um, uh, specialists in communications and media uh, were part of. So, so that would answer and some more questions. FDR didn't have to worry about social media. <laughs> yeah, Huge exactly. Thing. Yeah. Uh, we packed a very tight agenda. I'm very sorry for it. But we have one question from Zoom. Uh, Mac is monitoring questions on Zoom. We're, we're going to answer much more briefly, right? OK. Yeah. <laughs> so there are more than 180 people joining us today on Zoom. And I'm going to ask a question from one of those virtual participants. Lori Tish, a great friend to Hunter College and to Roosevelt House, she asks, do you think it's possible for some type of paid leave to come back, perhaps with a minimum of four weeks? So I, I tweeted uh, this morning that I thought it was, and people were laughing at me on Twitter saying I was naive. But just to quickly say why I, I think it's, it's quite possible. Um, there is some support among uh, some Republican senators for family leave because it's so popular with the public. Now, they can't vote for this bill, because this huge bill. It's a party line matter. But even on the infrastructure bill, they got a, you know, they got a bipartisan coalition together for that. And they got, I think, what was it, nine, uh, 19 uh, Republicans. So it's very possible that early next year, after everybody's kind of recovered from this, and they come back and start legislating again, uh, that they will introduce uh, under reconciliation family leave as a standalone bill. And I think it's, I'm not saying it's a sure thing, but I think it's quite possible that e even if they get nothing in this bill in the next few days, they'll uh, come back for more. And we haven't even talked about if they move to a talking filibuster, which um, is quite possible. Uh, Senator Durbin told me recently he thought there was a reckoning coming hmm. on the filibuster. People have seen it as a binary thing, like keep it or eliminate it. It's not binary. There are these reform ideas. It's probably not going to be a carve out because Manchin's against that, but he's open to the idea of a talking filibuster. And if that goes through, then you, you could get immigration reform, you could get uh, reproductive rights legislation that would do something about this horrendous Texas law and, and possibly even a, a gun 
safety uh, measure uh, and maybe some other things and force those guys to have 41 members on the floor at all times. There, a lot of them are old. They, they can't stay up all night, night after night after night with these filibusters. And you know, you could have a Jimmy Stewart, return of the Jimmy Stewart filibuster and, and actually get some things through. Now, people might say that's Pollyannish, but I think it's possible. Uh, with apologies, uh, we're going to have to wrap up. You, you did uh, I'm sorry. I didn't raise the question short. of the filibuster. We have the world's leading expert on the filibuster on the next panel, panel Adam oh, Gentleson. Sorry. Uh, so we will uh, learn more about that as a pivotal part of the sausage baking process here. Uh, so it, if you want to take a couple minute break, stretch your legs, well, let's come back in like three minutes for the start of the next panel. Thank you all.